press start. Hello, good morning and welcome to our maternity session, Understanding for Health and your journey through labour and birth with UHD Maternity Unit at St Mary's Pool. So today we're going to um, just go through with you uh, your journey through pregnancy and birth, labour and birth even. And I would just like to talk through, first of all, the stages of labour. So the first stage of labour, before we get started, it's best to just talk a little bit of physiology. So your uterus is where your baby grows. And when you're not pregnant, it's about the size of a fist and it sits perfectly in your pelvis. But as your pregnancy grows, that wonderful strong muscle grows with the baby. It's actually the strongest muscle in the human body. And when it's time for you to go into labour, that is the muscle that will contract and push your baby's head onto the cervix, which needs to open to enable your baby to be born. So at the bottom of the uterus is a tube called the cervix, and that cervix needs to open to 10 centimetres to allow your baby to be born. So if you could just visualise your baby putting a t-shirt over its head, that's what it is like as the cervix opens and allows your baby to be born. So when the contractions come, those strong muscles from the uterus will push your baby's head onto the cervix, make it open. And when your baby's head has completely come through the cervix, you will be ready to give birth. Now, the first stage of labour can be very long and it varies from lady to lady. But for the average first time mum, we would expect that once you're having regular painful contractions, that you will have about 12 hours worth of those before it's time to give birth. But that can vary from woman to woman. And with second and third and fourth babies, that time really drastically often reduces. But we don't make any promises here. It doesn't always reduce. So. By the time your baby's um, head is fully through the cervix and the head is sat completely in the vagina, we enter the second stage of labour. And you will be showing us that you're ready for that stage of labour by telling us that you need to go to the toilet. What happens physiologically is your baby's head pushes on your back passage and gives you an enormous feeling of needing to go to the toilet. And that is the sensation that you will listen to when it's time to birth your baby. And when every contraction comes, instead of feeling the pain in your tummy, instead you will feel like you need to go to the toilet to bear down and push with each contraction. For your average first time mum, that can take about an hour before your baby's head is born. It is very much one step forward and one back for a little while. Um, but as your body allows your baby to be born, eventually the head will keep coming forward. Once your baby's head is delivered, while we wait for the next contraction, what we will see is the baby shifts itself into an optimum position to enable your midwife to help gently deliver your baby. After you've delivered your baby and you have a cuddle, we then need to think about delivering the placenta. This is what we call the third stage of labour. And there are two ways in which we can do that. We can either do nothing at all and let nature take its course. So naturally, the placenta will detach with mild contractions, fall into the vagina and be ready for you to push out. Or instead, you can choose to have an injection given by the midwife into your thigh. And within two to three minutes, the placenta will naturally detach and the midwife will gently remove the placenta um, for you. So those um, that's a very much a whistle stop tour of the three stages of labour. Um, going back to the first stage of labour, it's important to know when you need to call us. So we have included the labour line number on this slide for you, but you should find that within your Badger Notes app. This is the number that you can call when you think labour has started. We will generally invite you into the maternity unit when you're contracting regularly. So when you're having um, roughly three contractions every 10 minutes that are long lasting and you're not able to have a conversation while they occur. If at any point your waters break, 
then um, you need to give us a call and we will bring you in for an assessment. Physiologically, your water should break just before you give birth to your baby, but these babies never follow our plan. And um, some babies will break them as at the first sign of labour and some not actually until the head is being born. So the most important message you need to know here is if at any point you think your waters have broken, give us a call and we'll give you the correct guidance. I'm going to hand you over to Sarah now, who is going to talk about how you can cope with early labour. Hi, I am Sarah. I'm one of the community midwives in Bournemouth. Um, I'm really just going to talk to you about some of the advice we would give you to keep you at home for a little bit longer. It's quite a good idea not to come straight into hospital when your contractions first start. Sometimes you will have what we call a long latent phase, which is the beginning of labour. Um, and there are lots of things you can do at home to help yourself stay there. It's a good idea to be relaxed because the more relaxed you are, the more successful the contractions are and the quicker, hopefully, you dilate. Um, contractions can start even like one every 20 minutes. Um, if your contractions are like that, try and ignore them because they're really not going to do anything at this stage. They're not dilating your cervix. They're just getting your body ready. So some of the advice would be sort of um, with massage at home. This is what partners can do. Uh, we have some beautiful oils as almond oil or grapeseed oil. You can find those in any of the health food shops. Um, adding to that, if you're able to, if you want to um, and you like, there's lavender oil, which is a nice gentle oil or bergamot, a couple of drops in each. And you can make a really nice relaxing oil for a back massage or a hand massage. Um, so if you want to find out more about the oils, you can actually look that up yourselves. Um, peppermint oil is another good one because sometimes in early labour you can feel quite nauseous. So a bit of peppermint oil, just just a few drops on a cotton wool bud will actually help you to reduce your nausea. We want to make you as comfortable at home as possible because we want you to be there for as long as possible. Um, <clears throat> some women will want to hypnobirth. Um, it's the things that you learn in hypnobirthing classes are actually really useful for anybody in labour because it allows you to visualise, it gives you visualisations, it gives you a chance to be relaxed and to um, just concentrate on your breathing um, and be a, follow a rhythmic pattern. Um, let me just look at this slide, have a read of the slide as well. Uh, So you have all this water going on as well because water and thinking about your baby in water, it really helps you to focus in. Um, and we do want slow, deep, rhythmic breathing. Uh, the next slide says that warm baths are really good. So if you have a bath, fantastic. Fill it up to a temperature that you feel comfortable in. Don't make it too hot, not too cold. Um, we would suggest you do that. Even if you've had one bath, you can go into another. It, it is for not for hygiene. It is to actually help you relax. Um, Contractions can be like anything between one in 10, one in six, maybe even one in four, and you're still not ready to come into the hospital. Um, if you're in the bath, you will find usually your contractions will slow down a little bit. Um, don't worry about that because once you get out, they may well speed up again. Um, if they don't, again, please don't worry. Just rest and enjoy the time because it will happen again. Um, and paracetamol is a really good um, help at this stage. Just take, as it says on the screen, one gram, which is two tablets um, every four hours, no more than eight tablets in 24 hours, but it tells you in the packet what to do. Uh, if you don't have a bath, use a shower. Showers are really good also, or a hot water bottle, not too hot, but on your tummy or your back. Some people have backache labour. With the backache labour, it's quite a good idea to think about hiring a TENS machine. TENS machines are not on offer from us, but you can hire them yourselves. Just have a look on uh, online or ask your community midwife. She'll be able to help you. They are really helpful machines that actually um, block some of the pain pathways to the brain. So you're not feeling quite as much pain. It's quite a good distraction as well. And it also builds up your natural endorphins. So we are trying to reduce your adrenaline and increase your oxytocin. So adrenaline comes when you're scared and, and stressed. 
um, oxytocin, oxytocin builds when you're relaxed and in a nice calm environment. So that's what we're aiming for. Birthing balls also are quite useful because we're thinking about your position as well, position of you. So I always say to my ladies, uh, knees lower than hips in whatever position you're in. So imagine riding a bicycle or riding a horse. Um, as you see the lady on the screen, she's got her knees that are lower than her hips when she's turned over slightly. That also allows her um, abdomen to hang a little bit. So it's a bit like a hammock for baby's back and baby can come into the hammock. And that's a really, really good position for babies to be born. It also helps them to, to descend more into the pelvis. Um, uh, so also um, rest is good, bath is good. But um, mobilizing it is also a really good idea to be upright to be rocking to be dancing if you want to um, it's good to go for a walk outside because that will distract you a little bit if you feel like you can do that don't don't feel you have to be confined to your one room it's a good idea to use your whole house um, looking back at the lady on the birthing ball if you haven't got a ball you can still use your sofa or um, other things in the house to lean against it says here about crab walking that means sort of going up up and down the stairs sideways that allows the hips to turn and again the baby's head which is a bony bony thing into a bony pelvis needs a little bit of help sometimes to move down so that's a really good way of doing it um, as part from mobilizing obviously it's good to rest as well uh, when you do rest on your left side put some cushions around you maybe between your legs just to help your hips um, and eating and drinking. So all these different things are really important. It's really important to eat and drink in early labour because it can go on for a number of hours. Um, on here you've got things like bananas, fruit, chocolate. Um, as your labour gets more progressive, you will need to, to reduce the content and increase the sugar. So things like the chocolate is good, but jelly babies um, and even in the end honey. So if you like honey and it doesn't affect you badly like no allergies there honey is really really useful it's got an amazing amount of sugar in it a good energy boost and you can have it in many forms so honey on toast honey in water like a honey drink or in the end it'll be just on the spoon so if you like it go for it um, just to remind you that a lot of the squashes that are available nowadays have no sugar in them, so they are absolutely useless for you. What you will need is cordials or um, Lucasade if it's not sugar free, um, that sort of thing. So have a look around to see what you can find in the shops. Okay. Um, that's it. OK, that's the end of um, early labour. Obviously, at any point, please phone Labour Line. Um, if you're not sure you want some advice, we're really happy to hear from you, but do try and stay at home as long as you can. And I'm now going to hand over to Rosie, who will tell you about the next stage. Hello, um, I'm Rosie. I'm a rotational midwife and I'm going to be talking to you guys today about the Haven Lou Risk Birth Suite. And um, you can see on the slides that this is one of our rooms, which is the Lotus Room, and it's got a bed in it, it's got a pool in it, and it's got also a birthing chair and birthing balls. Um, we have five rooms available on the Haven. We've got Lotus, Rose, Lavender, Camar and Jasmine. Lotus, Rose and Jasmine also have all have pools in. However, Lavender and Camomile don't have pools in. We try and use mainly the Lotus, Rose and Jasmine for the labour rooms um, and they've all got on suite rooms too. I'm going to talk a little bit about positioning in labour. Thank you. Um, so in labour you can be in whatever position you feel most comfortable in, as Sarah said earlier. You might find that you start walking around and upright and then as labour progresses you want more support and you may find it more comfortable to be sat in a chair, leaning on your birthing partners for support or using the bed too for some rest. You don't have to stay in the same position and you can move position whenever feels comfortable for you. In the birthing rooms, we have a birthing pool, which we fill up with warm water, which some women use, choose to labour in and some women choose to give birth into. In the pool, you can still use the end snorks, gas, and your partner can be with you the whole time if you no. choose. We also have the birthing chairs, which you can sit in on the front of, and there is a seat behind you, which your birthing partner can sit behind you too, if you wish for support, and can be a great position for you to try and some massage for pain relief and relaxation. On the birthing chair there's also a cloth which you can lean on and hold on to while sitting on a birthing chair on a ball and just lean on and hold on and use gravity. The bed in the room also is very diverse and can be adjusted into multiple positions. There's a throne position where you're sat upright and it turns into a chair or you can lie down on your left side or your right side. You may also at this point wish for a peanut birthing ball to be between your legs to allow your pelvis to open to help the descent of the baby's head. You may also wish to lie down in a semi-recumbent position on your back or kneel over the back of the bed too. There are infinite options. 
There are also mats in the room you might wish to kneel on or be on all fours on or even lie down and have a rest in too. There's also a reclining chair which you may wish to use in early labour to rest or as you progress too. Many partners also use this chair to have a quick nap or rest, especially during the night time. Some people also wish to sit on the toilet, which is a very natural position to be in. However, we try and avoid having babies on the toilet at all costs. So the birthing chair imitates the toilet too, and it has some padding on, which is also good for your bum for some comfort. You may use, also wish to use the showers as they're all on sweet rooms, if you prefer, compared to the birthing pool, to refresh yourself or if you don't want to soak for a long time. Another thing we have on offer is oils. At UHD Pool Maternity, we are very, very lucky to be able to use various aromatherapy oils. As you can see on the screen, we have eight different scents that we are able to use, each with different properties. We recommend to use different scents in different parts of labour, such as early labour, first stage, second stage, third stage, and also postnatally. Up to three oils can be used in one blend at one time. If you're allergic to a certain scent or dislike them, we can avoid them in the oil combination. We've also recently had some funding on the Haven and have bought some star projectors, which are Bluetooth as well. So you can connect your phone and play a birthing playlist, which you created or find on YouTube too, or even the radio if you wish. The projector changes colours, shapes and speed, which can be adjusted by the controller in your room and it displays like a galaxy print on the top of the roof. Any of the oils can be mixed with grapeseed to create a massage oil. You can collect this from Haven too in early labour assessment or through your community midwife. This can be used at home to relax or in the unit too. We can show birthing partners how to use simple massage techniques if you go home or within the unit. We also provide oil too to use at home whilst in the bath. We don't add any oils directly into the birthing pool when you come into the haven just because the oil does not disperse before baby is born. We can also make warm compresses infused with oil which can be used as pain relief and can be placed on the back for cramps, shoulders and neck for tension or the perineum for delivery or abdomen for contractions too. Additionally, we can make cold compresses for swelling on the perineum postnatally or to cool you down if you're in the birthing pool across the brow or the neck. Also, we have water in our rooms. In three of the labour rooms, there are birthing pools. You can bring and wear a bikini if you wish to, or you can go in partially or fully naked too. There are stools that your partners can sit next to you on or the birthing balls too. You can use entonox and massage techniques whilst in the pool. We can help you with this. You can kneel, float or recline whilst in the pool. These pools take about 20 to 30 minutes to fill up and then they are ready. We check the temperature of the water every 30 minutes and then can drain the water if we need to and add some hot water too. All of our equipment is waterproof so we can listen to your baby's heartbeat for monitoring in the water and you do not need to get out. You can labour and give birth in the water too if you wish and you can deliver the placenta in the pool or you can get out onto the bed, it's up to you. Finally we offer Enstox within the unit. Enstox is also called gas and air as a pain relief. It's connected to a supply in the wall, so it's not canisters, so don't worry, it doesn't run out. There's a port by the bed and also a port above the birthing pool, so you can use it whilst on the bed, birthing pool, standing or floating in the birthing pool. Don't forget to bring a water bottle with a straw piece for easy use and a lip balm too, as the end stocks can make your mouth quite dry and you can feel very dehydrated. Please also feel free to bring any snacks you want, any drinks with you, music to connect to the speaker in the room and anything you may wish if you wish to hit birth. You can use the TENS machines uh, in during early labour in different stages of labour. Lots of women like it in the early stages and as distraction techniques. However, we don't rent out any TENS machines within the unit. However, you can buy them online or in shops, even such as boots. They can also be used afterwards too for pains of breastfeeding or even muscle pain. Another form of pain relief on the Haven we offer is called pethidin. Pethidin is an injection into the leg. It can be given every four hours, however we don't like to give it too close to birth as sometimes it can make baby a little bit sleepy upon delivery if given immediately before birth. Pethidin is an opiate drug so it does cross the placenta and a small amount will pass through to baby. However, don't worry, we will monitor you closely and your baby closely when we give you this drug. You may have also heard of an epidural and remifentanil, which are types of pain relief we offer in Cool Maternity Hospital too. However, if you would like these, we would need to transfer you to CDS to have these, as we would need continuous monitoring for a baby. I'm now going to hand over to Anna, who is going to discuss about the labour sweep. Thank you, Rosie. Hello, my name is Anna Eaton. I'm a midwife and I'm also a matron for Labour Ward. So I'm going to give you a, um, uh, some quick information around fentanyl and also epidurals. 
So remifentanil is a short acting opioid analgesia, very much like pethidin, which means it works quickly and then will, when stopped, its effect will disappear quickly. So it can also be used alongside to help you with your contractions. It is similar to pethidin, as I said, and can be used alongside entonox. Small doses of Remy will be given via a patient controlled pump through a small tube inserted into a vein called a cannula. Um, women have said that compared to pethidin, they were more satisfied with the, when they were um, using Remy fentanyl, but compared to an epidural, it was less effective. Effectiveness will vary from woman to woman. Some women will be allergic to some of the um, to something that Remy is has got inside it, so perhaps may not be suitable for any fentanyl. Your midwife will discuss this with you. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Remy will have an effect on the respiratory system, uh, which means it will affect your breathing and your heart rate. So what we will do is we will monitor these continuously um, whilst you are using the Remy pump. The movement may also restrict, um, be restricted as you will have a pump on a stand. So say if you need to move around or you need to go to the toilet, um, you will need to take your drip stand with you. Some women will feel sleepy and sometimes a little bit sick. Um, obviously, if you're feeling sleepy, then we will get you to lie down on the bed. And if you're feeling sick, we can help you with this for, with analgesia or sometimes with some aromatherapy oils such as peppermint. The baby will um, the baby may be slower to breathe at first as Remy will have an effect on the baby as well as the mum. So what will your, what will happen during your labour when you're using Remy is that your midwife will stay in the room with you. She will monitor your breathing and she will monitor how much oxygen you have uh, whilst you are breathing. And these will be monitored really closely. For women that are using it for a short period of time, um, this will dissipate really quickly and will not necessarily have an effect on the baby as soon as it's born. For women that um, for women that use Remy for a long period of time during their labour, the baby is slightly more at risk of being born and just needing a bit of a nudge to start breathing for themselves because they too are sleepy, as perhaps you might be. One in 1,000 women will need to stop using it because it slows their heart rate too much and some may need to be given oxygen. So this will be why your midwife won't leave the room when you're in labour. And if she needed to for any reason, another midwife will come in and take care of you, say if she needed to go for a comfort break. So the next slide, we'll talk about epidurals. So epidural would be the next step up in terms of pain relief and also in terms of um, how this will affect uh, you in labour. So an epidural is a local anaesthetic and a painkiller, also given through a fine tube which is given um, into your back. Epidurals are administered by an anaesthetist and they use a sterile technique. You will need to have a cannula inserted, again like the Remy, and this will go into a vein that's usually in your hand or your arm. You will be given fluids to help balance your blood pressure, as sometimes um, uh, uh, the administer of an epidural will reduce your um, blood pressure. So this is monitored carefully. And then you will have continuous monitoring of your baby's heart rate. So you will um, have attached to you a what we call a CTG monitor and it's to look at the um, baby's heart rate continuously and it also tells us about your contractions as well. You'll still be able to be mobile with the um, CTG because we have wireless monitoring for these. So if the epidural that's been administered enables you to still move around, you'll still be able to be um, mobile with your CTG on as well. Next slide. You will be supported into a position, so this is to help administer the epidural. You will be supported into a position to enable the anaesthetist to insert the tube using a needle and this will um, may vary on average to about 20 minutes this will take. So the midwife will help you get into this position and then it's really important that we do our best to keep you nice and still while this is being administered. We will not try to do this while you're having a contraction. So sometimes it could take a little bit of time because we need to do this um, in between your contractions. Once it's been administered, it then usually takes for most women about 20 minutes for it to become fully effective. Your observations will be monitored regularly as the epidural, as I said, can lower your blood pressure. 
and this will happen uh, quite a lot to start with and then there'll be regular observations while your epidural is working and again that's because your, it monitors it can lower your blood pressure we will also check the block levels. So it's really important that we have a block that's effective for the area that it needs to be. So we don't want your legs to be too affected and we don't want it to go too high so your breathing is affected. So the midwife is looking after you, she will monitor these for you. You will be given a button which is attached to your epidural and you will control this pain relief. So you'll be able to press your button as many times as you need to you can't give yourself too much because it will have a lockout system on it. So you just press it as you need it. But as I said, it takes about 20 minutes after it being administered um, for it to become fully effective. And you should be feeling much more comfortable at this point. Um, next slide, please. So epidurals can have a higher chance of needing oxygen, oxytocin, sorry, to help make contractions regular and stronger. So the oxytocin that we would give you is, is the same type of oxytocin as if you're needing to have an induction of labour. One in 10 epidurals will need to be recited to make it work a little bit better. Now this could just be to do with um, the anatomy of your back, the position that you were in, the amount of contractions you were having while we were trying to do this. So there's lots of different reasons why this could happen. And as, as we said, one in 10 is quite a lot. So it, just imagine that this might be something that needs to happen to you. If you have an existing back condition or a blood clotting issue or a high BMI, um, you may not be suitable for an epidural. So this perhaps is something you can discuss in your pregnancy with your community midwife. And if she feels necessary, what she can do is refer you in so you can have a little chat to an anaesthetist while you're still pregnant. So you can get your ideas of what you can and can't have, what you really like, what you're not sure about during this appointment. And that can be added to your birth plan. And that's it from me. Oh, the only other thing I wanted to talk about, actually, so on Labour Ward, we now are able to have ladies that are being induced. So some ladies need to be induced and uh, lots of different reasons why they need to be induced to start their, their labour. Um, and what you can now do is labour in the birthing pool for many of those women. Not all of those women, it depends on the reason why you're being induced, but many of those ladies can actually get in the pool, still be monitored, still have your oxytocin infusion if that's what you're needing to have to help you with your labour contractions. So again, if you're liking the idea of this and induction of labour has been um, talked about with you, feel free to have a conversation with the community midwife and she can also refer you in and have a conversation with maybe an obstetrician or one of our senior midwives in the hospital who can talk you through the benefits of this and uh, see if this is an option for you. This would need to happen on Labour Ward, but we do have a birth in on Labour Ward. That's me finished. I'm now going to hand over for questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Indeed. A brilliant talk as always. So thank you very much for your time and for those uh, for those talks. Um, I've got quite a few questions here, so we'll start from the top if we may. Um, we saw lovely slides about uh, the Haven. Question here from email. How many people can come into a birthing room with me at the Haven? So birth partners is the same as what you would be allowed on labour ward and we allow two other birth partners in the room with the labouring patient. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. Um, and we've got another question here from the email. Um, uh, I am a nervous first time mum. I think we discussed this a bit in the talk, but at what point should I phone the labour line? I think there's some advice on the labour line in the talk. Yes, so um, obviously any time during your, your early stages of labour, if you feel you need to um, contact us, even if it's just for advice, then please do ring Labour Line because we're really happy to hear from you. We may not invite you straight in, but we might give you some advice as to how to stay at home a bit longer and just give you some um, further information. And the Labour Line is 24-7? Yeah, 365. that's the number to phone and you will get through to us. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, Here's a question um, from the talk. Uh, I suffer badly with anxiety. I'm so scared I will have a panic attack during labour. What can I do? And some of the, 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 the procedures you were talking about may, may help. Yeah, so um, it might be really 
worthwhile actually seeking out a hypnobirthing course. Maybe even we do have practitioners that do it. It, it does cost. It's not right. It is private. It's not on the NHS, but it may do you a lot of good actually to look into how to keep yourself calm because there are many, many methods. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but hypnobirthing is a really good way. Even if you don't fully hypnobirth, learning the techniques will really help you. You do have us around you. We will support you and we will give you advice. Um, if you put in your birth plan that you're anxious, we will know that and we will take notice of it. But all the methods that we've said here, trying to keep yourself calm, massage, uh, finding different things like TENS machine um, to stay at home for a little bit because it is much more in your best interest to be at home rather than coming in too soon because we will just send you home if you're not really dilating and not really contracting. Can I just add to that? We have a perinatal mental health midwife um, who's been employed by the trust to run classes, yoga sessions each week. Um, you can be referred to her by your community midwife. So that would be really useful to do in the pregnancy now. Um, she'll give you techniques, especially if you are worrying about birth, um, some techniques to actually help um, calm you. Um, there's meditation techniques, there's all sorts there. So along with the hypnobirthing, um, there's also positive affirmations and visualization techniques that you can do. Um, you can find them online on Google, but it might be worth finding um, a registered practitioner for that. And you can do that through the Federation of Antenatal Educators. So you just go online, um, find the website. It's feedant.org and then you pop in your postcode and it will come up with practitioners who are registered and actually um, licensed to actually provide those services. So you can do it that way if you prefer, um, but also to speak to your midwife, she can refer you as well. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. Um, another question here, as well as my birthing partner, am I allowed more family members to come and visit? So um, as we mentioned previously, we really do just keep a limit to two people with you um, in the building at any one time. We do prefer as well that there's not a constant changeover of people just to help to keep our maternity unit as safe as possible and reduce the footfall with things like pressures have reduced with COVID, but it's still real and um, not very nice for our pregnant ladies. So we would prefer that you just have two secure birth partners who are present with you. And that um, is quite an important question linked in with the previous lady as well. When you're thinking about who your birth partner is, for the father or the partner of of you um, it's quite an emotional time for them themselves they're watching the person that they love dearly um, in pain they're anxious as well so it's really thinking about who that second birth support person is and that could be a mum or a really good friend or just someone who you feel confident to help you through your anxiety thank you very much Steve. thank you um, another question here. What happens if my baby is poorly and needs to go to the NICU, which is a neonatal intensive care unit? Uh, so I've been paying attention. Will we have to go to another hospital? So it depends on the gestation, um, how many weeks pregnant you are when the baby is born. We Babies do sometimes need to go to NICU for lots of different reasons and we will do our absolute best as long as keeping the baby with us in our NICU at Paul is the safest thing, then the baby will stay with us. Depending on how well you are after your birth, you may need to stay with us. So you, as long as you're, you're as well as you can be and mobile, you can visit the baby as much as you like, as much as you want to. And then when baby is ready to come out, sometimes what we do if you have gone home, then we, we um, admit you back in and we support you in that transition of you solely caring for your baby again. So sometimes babies do need to go to other units. Um, we're lucky in the south because we have lots of units actually quite close to us and sometimes babies do go off to Southampton and um, Portsmouth occasionally. We've got Winchester and Basingstoke or other units that are fairly close to us as well as obviously Dorchester and Salisbury. So we are really lucky to be surrounded by that many units. Sometimes um, babies need to go because of capacity issues. Now again that is quite rare but it does happen. It has happened over the last couple of years. So we, I just want to reassure you though, that we do our absolute best to keep 
keep the baby as close to you as possible, but sometimes the baby needs to go outside of our unit because it needs specialised care that perhaps we don't offer. And then that's the safest thing for the baby. So what we'll do is then we'll transfer the baby if it needs to go quite quickly, that will happen. And then we will get you to your baby as quickly as we possibly can. So you're not separated for very long. We're really mindful when that happens that we need to um, reunite you as quickly as possible. I was just going to say the NICU team are really, really good at keeping you up to date with your babies. Um, is, am I right in saying there may be a video opportunity and pictures that they provide for, yeah. for mums as well, especially if you need to breastfeed and express. So they're, they're really, really good at um, keeping you updated with your babies and getting you to see your baby straight as soon as possible, yeah. really. That they're was very... a lot during COVID, didn't it? Because if for some reason they, um, you had your baby in COVID and, and your baby needed to go to the NICU, um, if a member of you or your partner, so the baby's father had um, COVID, you weren't able to go and visit because it's such, you know, a, a high risk area. So they did lots of videos and all sorts of things. So that's one thing COVID was useful for. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Um, another question here, very interesting one, I think. Um, does the moon affect labour? Oh, no. We all think so. <laughs> we all think so. I don't think there is actually Isn't any it? proper evidence out there. No. But we all do get a little nervous when there is a full moon yeah. because yes. it just seems to be that that is always the day that we will be very, very busy. <laughs> and actually, joking aside, when we look at physiologically, um, you know, the fact that most ladies do go into labour at night time, mm -hmm. don't they? It's when yeah. the body's calmed down, relaxed. It was often a safer time if you go back to caveman days mm -hmm. to actually have a baby. Um, physiologically, there's still something tuned in with the time that women will naturally give birth. And most of our babies, um, not most of them, but many of them decide to try and make an entrance at night time. So there is something in it. <laughs> and the full moon makes us anxious. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much for that. Um, another one here. Do you ask for consent before touching or examining me during labour? 100% yes. No. Nobody should ever touch or examine anybody without having consent first. Thank you for that. Um, uh, here's another question. I want to give birth at ho home. What happens if a midwife is not available due to staffing issues? Tricky one, that. Back to you. So um, we try very hard to protect our home birth service. So everything will be done to enable us to offer a home birth service if it can be done so safely. We try very hard to make sure that we've got good community cover um, and there are occasions where if we have sickness that that becomes more challenging. But we will always try and prioritise covering our shift so that we do have midwives on duty. Um, one of the issues that has recently prevented us from being able to always offer the home birth service is our ambulance response times. So every day, Twice a day, we do a little check in to see what's happening with our local ambulance service to check whether they're busy and whether our emergency department is busy. Because if our emergency department is busy, we know that in the next hour or so, so will the ambulance service. So there are occasions when when the ambulance service is stretched, we would encourage women not to access a home birth at that point because we can't guarantee how quickly we can get you into hospital if there is a problem. If at that point you were still determined to have a home birth and we had midwives available, we would still offer you support at that point. Being able to get emergency help if we needed to. Um, we are watching our home birth rates at the moment and it's it's very sad for us to see that they have dropped. Well, we say they've dropped, but in the last few weeks we've mm -hmm. noticed a real increase. Yeah, just um, <laughs> so we hope that as you know, ambulance pressures are changing a little bit, that we're starting to see that a move back to women wanting to have home births. But from our point of view, we want to give you assurances that we will do everything we can to offer a home birth service. The only reason we would suspend it is if it wasn't safe for us to do so. 
So we do need to have two midwives available to come out to the home. And we do we would like to have assurances that if we need an ambulance in an emergency, that they'll be able to attend in a timely manner. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I don't know if this is particularly in reference to to a, a von Tooth delivery, because my, my son had a von Tooth delivery and, and I do remember this. Uh, the question is, will my baby have a cone head and what happens if it does not go away? Um, so when I was talking about the stages of labour, um, we can definitely find that if um, if a baby has been in an awkward position and takes a long time to be pushed through the, the birth canal, that they can, even with a natural birth, end up with some bruising and a cone head. Do you want to talk Anna, a little bit about Von Tu's deliveries and what that does to the baby's head? Um, yeah. <laughs> Delighted. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, so yeah, some ladies do need to have a little helping hand to get the baby out. So what happens with um when someone needs a Bontu's delivery is that they've managed to brilliantly push the baby down so far that actually they can't quite get the baby any further. And we're at a point where actually the baby needs to be delivered. We need to give you a hand. You're probably a bit tired and you've been doing this a long time. So what happens is um, one of the doctors will come into the room along with probably the senior midwife on labour ward. So you have a few extra people in the room with you. Um, and they are basically just to sort of assess what's going on, examine you with consent down below. They will do a vaginal examination to check the baby's in the right position to be able to put a Von Tu's cap on. It's a little bit like a suction cap. And what they do is they attach it to the top of the head in the right position, which should be around here on the baby's head. And then with the contractions, you'll do some really amazing pushes. And one of the doctors will do some gentle pulling at the same time. And, um, and that will then help to deliver the baby's head. The baby's head is coming lovely. What they'll do is they'll take the suction to um, reduce the um, sort of trauma that will happen to the baby's head. So the baby will have a little bit of a bruise on the head, not always, but sometimes, and will have a little bit of a cone shape of the, the round um, cap that's been on the head. Now this normally goes really quickly, um, takes a couple of days for this to settle. Um, pop a hat on, not gonna see it. Um, and then just be a bit more gentle with the baby's head. And then we will just uh, monitor the baby as we normally would um, for any baby that's you know, been delivered with them um, uh, an extra bit of help. Um, so, yeah, it can happen. One of the things I always used to advise the mums to do is if you have had a baby born with forceps or von twos, they're going to be uncomfortable. Their head is going to be sore. The staff can ask paediatricians to prescribe paracetamol in the first few days, but most mums would prefer to avoid painkillers if they could. But it's about the handling of the baby. So it's how you hold your baby. And most people will cradle the baby in the nook of their arm, but that's going to be really sore for their little tender spot at the back of their head. So it's about maybe instead just holding the baby around the nape of the neck so that you're not constantly touching the bruised area mm -hmm. and really limit the amount of people who perhaps cuddle the baby. All the visitors will turn up and they'll want to have a cuddle. But actually, right at that point, you want your baby to be not handled by lots of people. So just save those cuddles for most important relatives that you can't say no to. And everyone else has to wait until the head improves. Um, the bruising does tend to go away, although it can take a surprisingly long time, can't it, yeah. to actually fully disappear. And yeah. that, yes, and that's, um, I was just going to say exactly that, that they are much more likely if they've been born with the von Tuss and the forceps to have jaundice. Um, and that's a physiologically very natural condition that babies have. But if you have just given a baby a lovely bruise to their head, they're much more likely to struggle with jaundice. And so lots of feeding is encouraged and close monitoring for us to establish if there are any further concerns. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm glad to say my son does not have a cone head and, and, and uh, he's, he's, he's no, no long suffering. Um, a question here about um, a, a vegan. I'm a vegan. Do you, I have to bring all my food in with me or do you offer vegan food if I need to stay in hospital? So we would suggest while you're in labour, bring yourself some snacks that you um, find that you like. 
that are suitable for yourself. For meals afterwards, while you're staying in the hospital, we do have vegan menus. So we can provide lunch, dinner and breakfast, although we don't have the milk. So you might want to bring your vegan milk in. Brilliant. Thank you. Good answer. Um, is there a safe, is there, sorry, not a safe, is there an option for stem cell retrieval? Is there an option for that? Um, so we don't um, offer that service ourselves and there are very few maternity units across the country that are actually able to facilitate that themselves. We don't as a maternity unit promote the um, stem cell usage, um, but if families did want to use that service, they can access it privately and, um, and put arrangements in place for stem cells to be collected. Remember correctly um, from when we used to do it many moons ago, moons again, um, there was a company that did it, but they it kind of affected the breastfeeding and the um, delayed cord clamping because it the the actual cord had to be taken quite quickly after birth. So you may want to just have a think about that third stage of labour, the fourth stage of labour with the feeding and all of that that, that entails that, you know, we're still sort of um, finishing off your labour really in the birth. So that may interfere with it. I'm not sure because I'm, I'm not au fait with the, the latest with the stem cell collection, so. And that would be exactly why we there is no national guidance that says that um, this is something that families should be encouraged to do. These are private companies who are encouraging families to for a cost store stem cells. If that's what you decide you want, we will do our best to support you with that. We can't make any promises because sometimes cords are very thin. Um, sometimes a cord has to be separated quickly because we need to resuscitate a baby. Um, we will do our best to to make sure that those cells, are, the blood is saved for you to collect, but um, that's the best we can do really. Thank you very much. Sid. We've got two questions here on the birthing pool. Uh, first one, quite a practical one. How long does it take for it to fill? Um, and the second one, is there any risk associated with pool delivery? As Rosie said earlier, it takes approximately 20 minutes to fill the birthing pool. Um, there aren't any well, there are always risks with any childbirth, so we would just take that into account. Um, to use the birthing pools on the Haven, we do have a criteria um, that women would need to meet in order to facilitate those water births in the first place. So we would do a risk assessment prior to entering the pool and using the birthing pool. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, another one here. I'm trying to quit smoking during pregnancy and have switched to a vape. Can I vape during labour? Um, so, you, well done, amazing. Firstly, <laughs> try and stop smoking. That is absolutely the best thing to do for you and your baby. Um, it, you can't vape in labour rooms, unfortunately, because we have oxygen piped into the rooms in all of our rooms. Actually, all of our rooms generally within clinical areas. Mm -hmm. So it is a fire risk, unfortunately. So no, sorry. But if you're really mobile, you could go outside. Mm. As long as you don't go too far, you could still mobilise outside whilst you're in labour. Yes, yeah, so and we do offer um, support with you once you're an inpatient. We can um, prescribe patches for you to help you with any cravings that you may still be having. That's a good idea. But yeah, we, we don't want to blow up labour wall. Thanks. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, um, uh, Here's another question. I have a BMI of 35. Would you be allowed a water birth or would I? Sorry. So it depends um, on whether it was a first baby or subsequent babies. So in order to use the Haven birthing suite for ladies that haven't, it's their first baby, we take up to a BMI of 35. Um, for ladies that have had babies more than one, we do take BMI is higher than 35. Um, it also depends on um, how mobile, height, pain relief, lots of things to take into consideration. So up to 35, then yes, we can accommodate it. 
But again, it depends on how many babies previously had. So as with every birth, uh, an assessment is done an on the individual is done case. with everybody, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, um, another question on the BMI front. If you need a C-section with a high BMI, if you're not able to get an epidural, what other options are there? So if, if an epidural is contraindicated for you, so for, for whatever reason, your other options are a spinal anaesthetic, which works in in sort of a similar way as something that kind of goes into your back and it anaesthetizes you quite quickly um, and is quicker wearing off than an epidural. So it's a quick, dense, heavy block that then will wear off. Um, and then the other option, if if you continue, say the reason why you couldn't have an epidural was something to do with the anatomy of your back um, and, a, and a spinal was ruled out, then if we needed to take you to theatre, then possibly a general anaesthetic would be the next step if both of those options weren't um, OK for you. Thank you. And I know um, um, in, in a couple of years, the facilities will be changing when you move to Bournemouth to the new birth um, beach building. Um, um, but here's a question at the moment. Is it possible to rent a private room in the maternity unit for after labour? So no, we don't offer private facilities. We do have some side rooms on postnatal ward and we do have the postnatal rooms on the Haven birthing suite, but they're not for private patients as such. Yeah. So we can't book them. We don't know what workload we're going to have in. So we just have to wait and see. If side room is something that you would like, we would say suggest it to the midwife after the birth and she can see what's available. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, I have gestational diabetes. Is eating sugar and labour still recommended or should it be avoided? I would say is actually to be avoided if you need to stick to the sort of diet and the sort of food you've been eating through your pregnancy. Um, when you come into into the unit in labour, then we will keep a very close eye on you and on your sugar levels, um, and that will be monitored very closely. I would suggest as well, perhaps just check, check in with your diabetes team. They would be able to give you better guidance on what they suggest. So when you see them next time, just ask them that question. That's it. And we've reached the last question. So congratulations. Uh, uh, the last question is, can you have delayed cord clamping if you have the injection to deliver the placenta? Yes, that is actually possible. Um, so what happens, it takes about seven minutes for the injection to work. So when we when the baby is born up onto your tummy, obviously we're rubbing baby down and checking baby. At that point, we'll give the injection into your leg or consent. And then we've got about five minutes. So we do about five minutes of delayed cord clamping, which is ample for the baby to get a nice amount of oxygen through two ways, through breathing and through the cord. Uh, and then we clamp the cord to stop the rush of blood that comes as the placenta separates. So yes, five minutes is absolutely ample. I actually told a small fib there. Two more questions have come in. Sorry about that. Um, well, I can't explain this. Um, um, somebody is very um, 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 clever. You're all wearing different uniforms. Uh, what do they mean? What do they mean? What do all these colours and different uniforms mean? So we do have um, we do have posters around the maternity unit explaining what the different uniforms mean. Um, we are still a little bit muddled, aren't we, with the merger of two hospitals. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit confusing. But um, if we look at Donna, well, first of all, <laughs> we have a lovely student midwife here with her name. Yeah. We say Sinead, yes, make sure I get your name right, Sinead. So this is Sinead um, in a student midwife uniform. So you will see lots of these in our department. And we have Donna here, who is our band seven lead. So our senior ward managers will wear the red. I'm wearing the black. I'm head of midwifery. So the head of midwifery and director of midwifery have the black with the white stripes. And then we have our staff midwives. <laughs> community and Bournemouth community at the moment. Although we are the same team, we haven't actually changed our uniforms because I'm imagining it's going to change when we actually move across to Bournemouth. There is um, what we had heard a couple of years ago is that a national uniform was being planned. So rather than spending lots of money replacing uniforms that would need to be replaced again when there is a national uniform in place, we have not been in too much of a rush. Um, but there are posters around that do explain who's wearing what. <laughs> 
oh, this is an important uniform yeah. because <laughs> Rosie has on our preceptor uniform. So she has a green stripe on her arm, which just um, makes sure that in emergency situations, our team will know that Rosie is more junior and needs support needs potentially some support or show us how to do it right <laughs> and then Anna is one of our matrons and so she has the um gray uniform I think you've pretty much covered I've nearly everything other than a support <laughs> worker yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, that we were all looking. Yes. <laughs> the only uniform missing is our maternity support workers yeah and the doctors tend to wear scrubs but mm -hmm. everybody should have a clear name badge um explaining who they are and if ever you aren't certain just ask mm. support workers wear a lighter gray than this mm -hmm. this is like a bluey gray and they wear a, a, a light gray you know what battleship is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just uh, like wearing uniforms. So yeah. I'll wear whatever I'm given. <laughs> well, we've done well to get the full the full range, um, which is good. And then uh, this is now the last question. Um, um, I'm having a consultant-led birth. How is the ward different? The ward. That's the question. Um. So if, if you're um, consultant led, um, you might have a plan um, with your consultant obstetrician, with your doctor that tells you, perhaps advises you where they would want you to deliver. And that usually is on labour ward, um, just because it's um, for our higher risk ladies. Um, there's a bit more monitoring. Um, we've got our theatres within our unit. Um, so it could be that that's where they advise you to labour. All our inductions say you might be um, advised to have an induction of labour, you are then more likely to need, be admitted in the antenatal ward. Your induction of labour started there and then once you're you're ready for your labour care, you'll then come round to labour ward. Yeah, every, every woman is risk assessed um, um, when they're booked and they will be referred to a consultant if needed. If they come under a consultant, they can ask why, um, because on the Haven Birthing Suite, you can still come if you meet the criteria. So it depends why you are consultant led. So it's a good time to have a discussion with the consultant or the community midwife to find out why. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, just um, 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 before I say thank you all those who attended the talk today. Really appreciated you coming. Thank you for all the questions, amazing questions. This recording will be available online afterwards, along with lots of other health talks we've done. Um, so please do go on to the UHD website and have a look at our, our, our talks. Um, good luck for all of those of you who, who are sort of going to be using the services of our maternity unit. Um, but lastly, just to say a massive thank you to the team for all coming here today and, and, and being so brilliant with the questions and everything and for the talks. Thank you very much indeed to you all. Thank you.